So I have type 1 diabetes, which was diagnosed in 2002. I host a podcast that's sometimes about diabetes, and as a result of that hosting um, skill, if you want to call it that, Nick Dawson said I should moderate this panel on the new patient. Um, I'm also incredibly nervous, so please don't mind the jittering. Uh, this is what's going to happen. I've got a couple of questions in my handy notebook, but we have mics for people in the audience. There's one up front, and there are two in the back. After the first round of questions, this is supposed to be an interactive thing, and I don't want to ask all the questions. So if you guys have questions, line up in the mics, and I'll do what I can to see the mics and make sure you guys can um, get your input. For those of you on Twitter, where's the camera? Hi. Um, hashtag MedicineX, or excuse me, hashtag MedX, and Nick Dawson up front will hand me questions as they come through, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. I think we have 45 minutes for this panel. Um, so that's me. I've talked way too much. We're going to start at the end, have my panel introduce themselves, and we're going to... I guess get this thing going. Go ahead, Joe. All right, hello, I'm uh, Joe Reif. I'm known online as the prosthetic medic. I have a blog. It's about uh, me losing my leg and making the opportunity to actually voluntarily have my leg amputated so that I can return to work as a paramedic in Kentucky. I do a lot with uh, prosthetic activism, trying to get prosthetic parity passed, and uh, just push on that people need the, the, the limbs that they deserve, not the limbs that insurance companies want to pay for. My name is Erin Moore. I have a three-year-old son who has cystic fibrosis. Um, I blog at 66roses.com. Um, I am the state advocacy chair for the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation and do work with Cincinnati Children's trying to create a collaborative chronic care network for cystic fibrosis that involves and benefits uh, patients, doctors, researchers, and the whole community. Hello. Hello, I'm Emily Bradley. I have Stills disease, which is an autoimmune type of arthritis. And I also have a very rare genetic condition, um, a disease of the immune system as well. I blog at chroniccurve.com where I talk a lot about pain management and how we can get the patient into the center of pain management discussion. And I also talk a lot about attending university um, with a chronic condition that causes severe pain. I am a university student at Florida State. Go Knowles! <laughs> <laughs> no, thank, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Had to throw it out there. <laughs> That's great. I'm Jody Schauger, and uh, I'm a freelance writer and an advocate in the breast cancer community. I've uh, been an empowered patient since my mother was diagnosed with lung cancer, and uh, I learned that at that time you can dial 1-800 and go to the library. So my advocacy has changed forms, and my disease has changed forms. So I've was diagnosed with breast cancer myself, and that disease has metastasized. So now I'm an e-patient in back in the trenches again, as well as advocating for it. All right, uh, so since this is a big conference all about technology and social media and stuff like that, we're gonna start with the incredibly vague question of, uh, what do you, how are you using social media to advocate, connect with others, do what you do, share your story? Um, we'll start at the end, Joe, go ahead. Uh, for me, social media was what allowed me to get my prosthetic initially. The uh, insurance company I had at the time completely refused to pay for any prosthetic that's microprocessor because they considered it to be uh, experimental. Technology's been around since 1998, but to them it was still an experimental technology. So put on my blog, you know, this, they refused everything, was nice enough to give the, the phone number and the website so people could go and talk, and ended up shutting down their website and jamming their phone boards and get a call three hours later from the chief medical director saying, hey, We'll pay everything in full, just leave us alone. <laughs> so uh, so I, that's where it started. Now it's went on more to pushing for, like I said, prosthetic parity rights so, so people can get the, the limbs that they need to have. The right limb allowed me to return to work, whereas what they wanted to give me, I would have been sitting at home. And so now I'm a productive member of society. Instead of having all these secondary illnesses, I'm actually pushing forward and trying to get, make changes in laws and get things better on the amputee side of the healthcare spectrum. Very nice. Erin? Um, I kind of got into social media first through blogging. Um, when our son was diagnosed, um, right after he was born, it got hard to field questions from everybody constantly and answer the same stuff and talk about it over and over again. So um, I put it in one place and kind of directed everybody to that place. Mm -hmm. Um, and then as I got more involved, we started um, and started doing some fundraising and stuff. We went to Facebook and created a Facebook page where everybody could go and learn about the activities that we were participating in and, and hosting. Um, and then beyond that, when I got into Twitter, a whole new world opened up for us, um, meeting other people and patients who kind of wanted a voice and a part 
in this, you know, this system. They, they had expertise to share um, on how to make things better. And I've been able to connect with people that way. Um, and, and we've started to design this new way of managing health and care in cystic fibrosis. So <laughs> Twitter was really the big one for me. Emily? Um, I got on social media, I started with blogging. Um, I was 17, just diagnosed with a rare disease and I was angry. Um, so I started blogging as an outlet um, and quickly realized that I was filling a void. Um, there wasn't a, a resource dedicated to young teens and 20 somethings that had severe pain. Um, and by the time I got on Twitter, about a year after I started blogging in 2011, 2012, um, being able to to create a network of rare disease patients, you know, we don't meet very often in person. Um, there's very little information. There is not a single nonprofit organization for the rare condition I have. So we're we're very spread out. So that for me has been an invaluable network um, that that really gave me a purpose. And my life is now a before and an after. And really, social media was that defining line for me. That's exactly what I think. Um, you know, people will say, and rightly so, that, you know, there was a before and after. Ch cancer was the game changer. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, um, Health 2.0 was the, was the total game changer for me. Reading about Twitter, and I thought, wow, that sounds phenomenal. I jumped on Twitter, I started a blog, and the first thing that I heard, and one of the first things I did, is about listening. Mm -hmm. See who is out there. What are patients talking about? What are the patients, uh, you know, directly in my community, uh, uh, what were they talking about as far as cancer survivorship? You know, they'd finished treatment and they were just out there, like lost. Lost in, in translation, that's the IOM report. So um, I met a number of wonderful advocates on Twitter and we just continued um, with two other friends and, and you know them, they're here. Uh, we founded BCSM and we're having a 24 hour seven that goes globally talking about issues related to breast cancer, male and female, care, um, caregiving, late effects, the whole thing. I mean, and it was social media that changed the patient conversation. It gave us all a place to share those perceptions. And I, uh, it's changed my life. And, if, you know, and one of the things that I'm, that I've noticed through everybody's use of social media is that there's a big me too factor mm -hmm. and it's, it's also very empowering. And one of the other things is there's kind of a weird discovery thing where like, people hear about diabetes, people know about cancer because there's like the whole wear pink thing, but you don't really know that there's a whole community of people just like you or you know, similar to you until you go out there and start to share your story. Um, I think Emily, for you in particular, especially given you know, your rare diseases, what's that been like for you to kind of put yourself out there but all of a sudden kind of get that back tenfold? It's validation. Um, sometimes when you, you know you have these rare diseases, it takes years. I mean, 10, 20, 30, 40 years to get diagnosed. So you're without a label, you're without a community. There's no nonprofits for many of these rare diseases. Some of them don't even have names. Mine doesn't have a name. So to find someone that has you know that mutation you do or something very similar, um, it it is just. It's, it's almost in, like I, I struggle to find the words um, to know you are not alone in the world because when you're one in billions, mm -hmm. that is a very terrifying feeling. Like I get, <laughs> I get shaky yeah. um, just, just talking about it and thinking about how isolated I was before I connected with some of the people that I have. And, and just in the past three years to watch that grow of rare disease, you know, Still's disease is, a, is basically a type of rheumatoid arthritis, but it's so systemic and so rare in numbers that so to find those young 20-somethings and then some of the older patients that have far more experience, it's, um, there is nothing more that has changed my life as much as that has. You find mentors. Ab absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Mentors is a big part of the amputee community just because when you lose a limb, it, people automatically, uh, there's a young girl that I've been working with back home, she's 16 years old, lost a leg in a car accident, and just to see the difference from when I walked in the room to speak with her to when I left was amazing because walking in, she has this aspect that I'm 16, I've lost my leg, my life's over. I'm never going to do anything I want to do again. There's nothing for me to do. And then, you know, someone gets to come in. And for me, it was another amputee that came in and spoke with me the same way that said, look, I do everything I want to. 
I find new ways to do it, you know, it, but I do it. If I want to go rock climbing, I'll go. If I want to do whatever I want to do, it's possible. And so with that mentorship, to have someone that's been there that knows the pain you're going through, knows the days where, you know, some days I wake up and I don't want to put my leg on. It's a terrible day. I, I'm mad at the world because of what happened. And the same with a lot of these diseases. You just get angry at the disease yeah. or angry at the injury and let people know that that's normal. You're not the only one to feel that way. Because you see a lot of these people, and people, you may have had this experience as well, when they come to you, they think that you're happy all the time and everything's wonderful and they want to be like you because you always have this great personal outlook when it's not always that way. And it's nice to get a community that agrees with that, that feels the same way about that. Well, not only that, but in a community that says it's okay to not yes. be okay. Because we are so used to putting on a brave face. You know, you can't tell I'm at a level eight in pain right now. Um, but for someone to, to say to you, Amen. for tons yeah. of people to say, it's okay, mm -hmm. you can have a bad day, you can wallow in it, mm -hmm. you can stay in bed. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can and then swear. To get up, yeah, yeah. To, to get up the next not day. Not right now, we're not going to swear. No, we're not going to swear. <laughs> <laughs> not today. But to get up the next day and feel, you know, you're not alone, you've got people supporting you, mm -hmm. and it's okay. I mean, there's going to be a lot of conversation about the empowered patient, but I think especially with your Twitter chat that you mentioned, I mean, you're an empowered patient, but you're also empowering everybody else to become you know, patient, you know, more aware patients themselves and kind of share and, and embrace that community. What's that experience been like for you whenever you first kind of got started and, and like week after week, all of a sudden the conversations become too fast for you to even keep up with? Oh, it, it's, it, to say it's phenomenal sounds banal, you know. It, 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 uh, I've seen how a community forms, how a, um, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a pod of whales or, or, or dolphins <laughs> in that, you know, they flow together. If there's someone who's wounded in it and is suffering, the others come up and carry him or her along. Mm -hmm. And it cycles like this. And people who are going out into survivorship farther, well, maybe they go off and swim on their own. New people are always coming in. And... Uh, but I think the example of what I've seen it create in others, the example of mentoring, the example of being non-judgmental, uh, is really one of the coolest things in my life. Karen, what about you? You mentioned state advocacy chair. I mean, that's, I'm going to say, a higher profile position, but I mean, there's a lot more that would probably go with that when it comes to kind of sharing your story and making sure everybody else kind of gets their fair say and all that too, right? Yeah, definitely. I think um, social media wise, it's been a lot of knowledge sharing, knowledge that you can't necessarily get inside the clinic um, or you're not looking for, um, even on social media, you don't know what you don't know, but the stuff that you stumble upon is totally useful and valuable and life-saving in some cases and it's found outside of the clinical space. So being able to take that information and catalog it and being able to share it back with other people um, that's empowering, and it's empowering to people who don't, who aren't empowered, who don't have a voice, and who don't have access to the resources that we might, but who can still benefit from all of that information. Um, so, you know, it's it, for me, it's been it's been a little bit of that, but then also the advocacy stuff, letting people know that you don't have to be politically savvy to go share your story with Congress people. That's exactly right. Yeah, that, yes. that you're sharing your story. That's it. Mm -hmm. You're sharing your story, and nobody knows your story better than you know your story. So. Um, that's been that's been hugely use useful for us too. You, so you mentioned technology, and I feel like this is the, one of the elephants in the room as far as access. And I know that within the diabetes community, there are frequent conversations about how do we take the experience that we have online and bring it offline. So what what do you guys think could be done within your individual communities as far as trying to kind of share all that for people that don't necessarily have access to that technology? Because I mean, I look out and I see iPhones, I see iPads, I see MacBook Airs, MacBook Pros. Other non-Apple devices, obviously, those guys are fine too. <laughs> I'm, I, mean, I mean, for the record, I'm on Team Android, so you know, whatever. <laughs> but I mean, but not everybody has access to all that stuff. So while we have all these awesome stories that we can share, and there's a great community out there, I mean, what we have is kind of small in the grand scheme of things. So what do you think about trying to bring that conversation offline? One of the things that um, is in the back of my mind with that is that the percentage of people who have the cell phone is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So as we develop health communities, those that have it carry it forward. It's a, it's a simple Midwestern phrase, uh, bloom where you're planted. Mm -hmm. So if one patient is here, that one patient goes to his or her clinic and shares the way he or she was empowered with the next person. That person puts their phone to their next person. Mm. It can network 
much faster than we could ever make a plan to implement. Right. But if we all think of ourselves as that message bearer to the next person who was just diagnosed with whatever disease they might have, we make a difference every day with our phone, with what we say to them person to person. Mm -hmm. Emily? Well, adding on to what you just said, you know, I think we need to get um, physicians involved. You know, here are some some online resources. Here are some resources you can look at, you know, on your phone if you don't have a computer. And here are some resources in the community. Call this person. You know, you don't have a computer, give them a phone call. Um, I, you know, I think if we could get physicians on board, um, and some of them are, but more of them, you know, make it a, a global thing where we're saying, here, there are other patients that have been down this road. Here are the resources. They would love to speak with you. You know, create networks that are interconnected across different diagnoses. Right. Um, I think that would be life-changing for a lot of new patients and old patients, you know? I, know. Yeah. I was just going to say on top, the, the networking thing is, is critically important, so creating networks of, of patients and networks of patients and clinicians working together to share the knowledge that both have and pass it on through the more traditional means. So there are still clinical encounters. There are still, you know, in-person networking meetings. There are meetups now that people can meet in person and share stuff that way. But, you know, documenting your experiences and sharing them both through so social media and word of mouth also. Social media is just new age word of mouth. but. Yeah talking about it, talking to people, not keeping that information to yourself. Um, you know, it's doctors can't know everything, so we <laughs> share what we know with the doctors, and then hopefully they'll pass on our knowledge as well. And technology takes on a different aspect as far as our community. It is the social media, it's all that stuff, but also with technology, that's what lets me walk. That's what lets me do my job, and for a lot of people, that's what lets them, you know, if they lose an arm or a hand, that's what lets them live their life, you know. Uh, one of the examples that I like to give is there's a lady at my prosthetic office that lost both of her arms. She has three kids, so this is a mother who can no longer hold her own child, and people don't realize the impact that that would have, but yet if she gets the right technology, the right prosthetics, you know, the microprocessor, hands and arms, she'll be able to, you know, hold her child, do, do the things that her kid wants her to do, and so... It's not only just taking the technology of explaining your experience and putting it out there so other people realize they're not alone and getting these networks together, but also getting the technology to the people that deserve it. Mm -hmm. So apparently I've been notified that I'm, I've been a bad host and we didn't actually get a chance to, for you guys to introduce yourselves as far as oh. your Twitter handles are concerned. Oh. <laughs> um, so for those of you on Twitter, I am underscore Spartacus is the full thing for me. I am Spartacus, apparently. Um, so you guys can go introduce yourselves via Twitter, and then we can get back to the uh, actual conversation. Uh, via Twitter, I am at Dirte Medic, D-I-R-T-E-M-E-D-I-C. I am E. Keely Moore. I am Chronic Curve. I'm Jody with a Y, M-S. One of the topics that we had discussed before this panel that I was really excited about was the idea of firing your doctor. Yes. Um, and I know that there are some people out within the e-patient group up in the front that have had conversations with their doctors that ended with, you know, the, exactly those doctors being fired. Um, the whole idea of, of you being empowered, you understanding the power that you have as the patient, I mean, being an active participant in that conversation. Um, Joe, you in particular, I know you've had some fun conversations with your medical professionals. Um, I went to the, my orthopedic doctor once they told me that my knee was unrepairable. They decided they wanted to fuse my knee and my ankle. So this gives me a physiologic peg leg. You know, there's, you're not bending it, you're not moving it, you're just stiff-legged. Well, when I disagreed with him and said, no, I would rather you amputate my leg and let me get a prosthetic so that I can return to work, that didn't go over very well. He did not like this idea. He said that the limb still had a pulse, it still had muscle, therefore he would not amputate. So I said, you are no longer my physician, which is, doesn't go over well with them either. So when I go back to get my medical records, he doesn't like this idea. He says that I can't fire him, he's my doctor, you can't fire me. And I said, well, actually, yes, I can. Those are mine, and you need to hand them over. So after that, I go to another physician, explain my point of view that, you know, I'm a young guy. I want to get back to work. I want to be a productive member of society, and this is the only way this is going to happen. And I need the amputation to be able to do this. And he saw my point of view, and he was okay with that. But then explaining this to other people, you know, I fired my doctor. It's never heard of, especially in, you know, in Kentucky. Doctors know all. You don't question, you don't do anything different. You walk in, what well, the doctor says, you know, take this and take this, and you say yes. So for have someone come in and say, no, I don't have to do this. I don't have to go by your guideline is 
very empowering on our part, but it's also very terrifying for a lot of patients. And I found that it's even more terrifying for the elderly patient or the young patient. You know, us in the, like the middle age range, we're generally, we know what we want, we're going to do what we want. But for someone who's, you know, like with Emily, to go up to a doctor and say, yeah, I may only be 20, 21 years old, but I know my body and I know what I'm doing is unheard of. Emily, go ahead. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that's the understatement of the year. Um, my first experience um, realizing that, uh, you know, I could have a voice even at 17 when I, you know, first got sick. Um, I had a doctor who, I, I had rods in my spine. I had a full spinal fusion um, for scoliosis. And out of nowhere, seven years later, I had a lot of back pain. So I went to one of the top surgeons on the East Coast because um, I needed a new surgeon. <laughs> And I was, you know, on pain medication, not excessively, but, you know, to function. I was a full-time student, and I was working, and <laughs> and the comment was made um, that since they can't see anything past the artifact, the metal on the x-ray, that there's, you know, it, there's nothing wrong. Lose 25 pounds, do some physical therapy. Oh, and you have opioid-induced analgesia. And I hope I'm saying that correctly. <laughs> um, analgesia, yeah. And, and I, thank you. <laughs> and I said, I, you know, I, I left feeling very defeated. Um, my my parent was on the same page as the doctor, and I remember thinking, I am not taking these medications enough to to have this experience where my pain is, you know, is induced by this medication that was there before, and it has not worsened. It is so I went off the meds, and I stopped them, and, and I ended up having, a year later, a huge surgery, um, a massive, massive, massive surgery, and it was never the pain meds, and it was never in my head. And, you know, that physical therapy that I did for a year and those 25 pounds that I lost and, you know, all these methods that I tried, um, that's what taught me it doesn't matter what, what age you are. You know your body. It doesn't matter what shows up on an X-ray. A lot of the time you can't, you know, you have to dig deeper. Um, so for me that was what taught me even at 17. You have a voice. Um, so when I started blogging, that's what I wanted to get across to young 20-somethings and, and teenagers, you know, teenagers 16, 17, you're becoming, you know, who you are in an adult, you're learning that voice. And there wasn't anyone out there at the time saying, it's okay, you know, I, you might be a minor, <laughs> you know, you might still be under your parents' care, you might feel subservient to that doctor, but it's okay to have an opinion. It's okay to say, I don't, I don't feel okay about this. I'd never want to work with a physician who did not want to have a conversation with me. Um, the, the empowerment process where I would was selecting physicians was when I was diagnosed with cancer for the first time. And uh, I've learned a lot during that time. And um, the, I find myself in this weird situation now with, you know, advanced disease. And I was just notified the other day that my insurance was going to disappear. So, um, you know, facing a number of challenges going forward. But the more important thing is once you have, and uh, I was very, ask my friends will tell you, I was very mad at my oncologist for, for a while, this, at, right after this diagnosis, and um, dawned on me the other day, this is a conversation, and I need to take those concerns that I had back into the consults that we have so we can deepen the level of care uh, that, to make sure that I have communicated what's important to me as far as my treatment is concerned. So that's, you know, at different times, depending on your illness, that may or may not be an issue. The issue is communicating accurately who you are, what your levels of toxicity are as far as treatment goes how far you want to go for quality of life versus living, quality, quantity. So um, those are tough decisions, but hey, you know, there's, they're the ones that when you're sitting in this chair, that's the one we have to make. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as, as we talk about finding your doctor and, and being an active participant in the conversation, what do you look for whenever you're looking to hire a doctor? You know, are there any particular characteristics or any things that you're going to be asking that are kind of red flags depending on how they answer one way or another? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> for example, um, do you have any kind of... Yeah, I mean, not having a chronic condition myself, but caring for somebody who does, a small child, we're a team. I'm not in the camp of doctor knows best. I know best. He's my kid. He lives in my house 24 hours a day, every single day of the week. I'm the one who's caring for him. The, the instances that I interact with clinicians are 
you know, far and few between. They're just not, they don't know what it's like to live every day and be able to tell just by picking up my kid whether he's sick or not before there's any symptom involved. Um, and for me, I had to find somebody who was willing to acknowledge that they don't know best, that, that we're a team in this and we need to be able to work together. Um, and it took a little bit of time for us. I had to think outside of the box a little bit and try to communicate with them in a way that they would understand. So um, for me, a lot of doctors understand data. And so I gave them data. I took them data. I quantified symptoms and you know, different measurements that we track and everything. And I can take that to the doctor and realize that we, that working together doing this, we can improve outcomes. So it's definitely a true partnership for us. Joe, what about you? So you mentioned that you fire your doctor and eventually you found somebody that was going to cooperate and you know, work, work, work you know, kind of collaboratively, but was that the first person that you found after that? Uh, no. Uh, even with going through prosthetic companies and trying to find a process to work with, it's all... Who's going to, who fits you? Who works best with you? So the company that I went with for my prosthetic, to get my prosthetic, you know, I walked in and told them what I wanted. Like, you know, because I went to several other companies and said, you know, I'm an above knee amputee that wants to go back to work as a paramedic. And 90% of the answers were no. You can't do that. That's not possible. That's too stressful of a job. There's no way to do that as an amputee. Well, then I went to the company that I go to now and said, I want to be a paramedic. And he said, Okay. We'll make it happen. We'll design the socket that you need. We'll get you the need that you need to make this possible. So as far as that, that was one aspect to look for. But as for a physician, I look for someone who's willing to listen. I'm a healthcare provider as well. You know, I'm not uneducated on these topics. I know what I'm talking about. And then to add on the top, I know my body. I know how I feel. So if I'm telling you I have phantom pain, I'm having phantom pain. I can tell you the nerve bundle that's involved to make it happen. Right. But then you walk into some physician's office and you speak this way to them and they look down upon you for that. And I have no time for that anymore. So do, do you have to qualify your statements like that? Saying like, hey, I also work in the field. I know what I'm talking about. Yes. Also, I have phantom pain. Do you have yeah. To uh, with, uh, I've had that experience several times before finding the physician mm -hmm. I have now that I had to say, you know, I'm having this, this, and this. And they just kind of blow you off. I'm like, look, I'm a paramedic. I'm educated. I deal with sick people every day. Here's my pay stub. I can prove Yeah. I was like, right, here's, my, here's my license. Here you go. You know, whatever you want to see. I know what I'm talking about. And it, even with the pain control, we discussed this yesterday. Walk in and say, you know, I'm in pain. You know, I'm sorry, but I'm in pain. Well, you're just a drug seeker. That's the right. worst thing in the yeah, world for someone exactly. with chronic pain is to walk in and say, you're a drug seeker. We're going to label you this because once you get that label, and it's almost impossible to get rid of it. And so to find a physician that's willing to listen to you and willing to realize that, you know, pain is an illness of its own, that it has to be treated. And finding a physician that will listen to you and, you know, work with you, not do what I say and be above you. So, Emily, you're talking about diseases that don't even have names yet, so you're working with not necessarily doctor. you're working with doctors, obviously, but people that are you're supposed to be researching this stuff to try to figure out what it is. What's that been like for you? Uh, you know... My biggest thing, and I'm sure a lot of people with rare diseases or autoimmune diseases in particular, diseases um, with a lot of inflammation, our labs don't always reflect the state of our bodies. So when I see a physician and my inflammatory markers are relatively low because of the medication I'm on, but my feet can't fit into my shoes because they're so swollen and painful, um, if that doctor tries to tell me that, you know, I'm not having any inflammation, I, I'm out of there. Um, I'm in pain 24-7, and I don't need someone invalidating that. Um, and I, I live in Florida, and the pain control situation there, as most of you probably know, is quite intense right now. Um, and I can't tell you how many times, you know, and I'm sure you guys as well, have tried to do everything the right, responsible way. Talking to pharmacists, filling prescriptions appropriately, timely. Um, and it, it just, it's like hitting a brick wall over and over again. So finding a doctor that says, okay, we understand you've got complex pain of nerves, muscles, joints, uh, organs, um, and who validates that and says, okay, we're going to look at things comprehensively. We're going to try physical therapy. We're going to try biofeedback. Yes, we'll get you medication and make sure, you know, you understand the risks, but that you're also adequately managed. That's, um, it's, it's a must. And that's hard to find right now, at least where I'm living. That's very difficult. But um, I'm not willing to settle, and I don't think patients should have to settle for a quality of life they're not happy with, especially with a chronic condition that's not going to go away. Yeah. Right. Um, 
That's one of the most distressing things to me, to, to keep hearing this in, in talking with, with different patients, because I felt for sure that between the time that my mother died and now, dealing with the, can the, the pain that person with advanced cancer or a chronic disease has, that we would have a better idea that people would not be suffering like this. I felt surely by the time I reached this age, we would be farther along. And, and we got to get there. So I'm told we have about 12-ish minutes left, uh, trying to look to the bigger picture and kind of happy rainbows and sunshine and things like that. Um, <laughs> it exists. Come on. I don't have to say that. Uh, but as far as kind of impacting, you know, outside of your immediate family, inside, outside of just you, when you're thinking about the larger healthcare system, you're thinking about everybody else that, you know, has cystic fibrosis or is dealing with chronic pain or something like that, um, do, do you think about the impact that you might be having on the larger kind of healthcare system or even if it is just one person at a time? I mean, Aaron, we can start with you because you mentioned host on our podcast, which I don't want to plug that, but the C3N, I mean, you mentioned that I mean, that kind of stuff is happening with you guys, so yeah. you already are kind of active in trying to, you know, make, make a larger difference, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, there's, there's the, the opportunity for improvement exists, and there's simple ways that it can be done. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money or take a lot of time, but the little ways that people are making changes and, and you know, influencing others it can be spread, and social media is a great way to spread to spread that. Um, you know, the the collaborative chronic care network was something that I had heard about through the IBD community, and I thought cystic fibrosis needs one of these, and I pushed until we got it <laughs> because it's I need it. I have to. It's my kid. I have to fight for him, and I'm not going to stop until until we're cured. Um, you know, but finding ways to empower people who don't have the voice to speak up and fight for it. I'm fighting for those people, too, because they deserve the opportunity to be well just as much as everybody else does. Anybody else? Well, one, one thing that's really important in um, any disease community is to get yourself to the table mm -hmm. and find out where the research grants are and uh, get on those committees and sit down with the researchers and sit down with your legislatures. You know, I, I do, I've walked into about and continue to walk into about every advoc advocacy avenue that I can. Mm -hmm. And you talk to people face to face, it doesn't need to be long, um, but they need to hear from you and then they need to hear from you again. And um, so at the end of the day, you, that's part of empowerment. Mm -hmm. You know, that your best effort went forward, not just for yourself, but because of our, our, our bonds to each other and to help make it better for other people. And Joe, you mentioned that, I think it was a 16-year-old girl had her leg amputated. Yes. And I mean, that's, I guess, for, for you, there's more of an immediate kind of one-on-one -on -one pay it forward kind of aspect. Yeah. Do, you, do you think well, about how that kind of will kind and of snowball? There's that, there's the, there's the immediate, you know, I'm gonna go to someone who just had amputation and speak with them and show them that, you know, you can live a life. But there's also the aspect that we have, and all, all of us share this, is that we've been you know, somewhat successful in pushing our faces out there as a leader of mm -hmm. this disease or this illness or this injury and taking the time to say, reaching out to people who don't have the same avenues we do. That's right. You know, I was blessed enough that with my blog, I got my prosthetic. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't have that option. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I fought the insurance company. Now the insurance company changed their practice. They don't want to do it again because I told them the next person that asked for one, if I find out about it, I'll be back. <laughs> and I'll bring everyone with me and we will attack you again. They Coming deserve this. You. So they changed, they actually approved microprocessor knees now because they don't want to deal with that. They don't want the bad public image. And I'm not saying that you have to fight against them that way, but it's kind of that whole idea of, you know, I was blessed enough to have this. Let me reach down to someone who, who doesn't have the same avenues that I do. And just trying to pay it forward that way and trying to get, you know, like the mentor programs is huge in, in the amputee community. Uh, the Amputee Coalition of America is really big on that. They actually train people to go out and be mentors and, you know, send people out to, to show people the different avenues and different ways to deal with being an amputee. Because there's, it's a life-changing event. You're losing a part of yourself. So you get the effect on uh, self-image is probably the, the biggest issue that the young girl was having. You know, you have problems with self-image because you look in the mirror and you're not whole. And it takes a lot. Like, for me, this is my leg. This isn't my prosthetic. This isn't anything. This is my leg. This is who I am. But it takes a while to get there. Yeah. I think, too, one of the biggest ways that you can help other people is to just put yourself out there and be known and be persistent and be passionate about be it. Be available. 
and be candid. Um, yeah. When yeah. I when I started blogging, I was anonymous, um, and it was a big step to you know to put my name on there, to put my face on there, right. um, to have that identity merged with you know my school career, my pr my work life. That that's a that's a scary thing to do. But um, through this, I have been able to connect with many many med students, and for me, that has been amazing to get emails and messages saying, oh my gosh, you changed my entire perspective. Or now I'm thinking about going into rheumatology or something of the sort. It's, you know, it gives you hope. Um, and and we're, we're moving that discussion and that conversation into groups of people that don't necessarily have that disease. And for arthritis, that's a big deal because arthritis is very frequently brushed off as it's just arthritis. And there are a hundred different types of diseases under that word. Um, so Oops. to get some real awareness out there. <laughs> I think it's our time. Sorry, my Dexcom doesn't work uh, right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, are we out of time? That's yeah, uh, me too. I did not plan that. Was that was the gong. Sorry. Um, so I, th there are two more questions left. Nick, how much time we have left? Seven minutes. All right, so to, that, to your point about, I mean, you start off anonymous, and then you eventually kind of associate your name and your picture and things like that. Um, for all of you, quickly, where do you guys draw the line with disclosure? Because that's the one thing that is, is truly, you know, everybody is, is their own unique snowflake. What's best for you might not be necessarily best for everybody else, but where do you personally draw the line when it comes to disclosure online? Uh, I do with whatever folks comfortable that day, honestly. Uh, there's some days where I feel like being completely open, and I'll tell you everything that's going on. And there's other days where I decide that, you know, maybe that's, that's a lot of times if it's family involved, it, that's a little too private. I don't want to drag my wife or my sons into it. And there are times where I'll include them, but for the most part, I leave them out of that aspect. Uh, and I've mentioned their names on the blog and things like that. So it's just how you feel that day for me. I'm perfectly fine with being open and telling everybody my story and what's going on, but I don't feel comfortable speaking on behalf of my wife or children. Aaron? Yeah, I have different outlets for it all. I mean, I've got a personal Facebook page where I share stuff with family and friends, and I have a blog where I share stuff with everybody that might not be at the nitty-gritty level. I, maybe for some people it, it is, but, um, you know, and then Twitter, which is even a little bit different. Twitter's more professional for me and information sharing, not necessarily stool frequency. <laughs> I'm not putting that on yeah. Twitter. Um, so it's just, it's I, I try to direct it to you know, the audience that is interested in hearing what I have to say, and they're different for the different outlets that I have. You have to know your audience. That's, yeah. that's the yeah. big deal. Um, I think for me, it, you know, people don't necessarily want to read, and they don't necessarily want to talk about some of the, the uglier, nastier symptoms um, and experiences, but to put those out there for someone else that's struggling and not, you know, talking about it and, ha and is going through that alone, um, it, like Joe said, it's it's the day, you know, is yeah. this something I can share today? Um, and I tend to draw that line as well with family and friends because for me, I don't want, you know, I want some kind of line there, some kind of boundary. Um, I have great friends that see me as Emily, not Emily with Stills disease and a genetic disease and chronic migraines and the lists, you know. <laughs> um, and I kind of like to keep it, you know, sure. fairly separate. Jordy? You know, I had to take, uh, well, it's actually probably been about six months to kind of navigate this boundary after I received my diagnosis this spring, um, because I was so sh I was very shocked. I was not well, and um, I had to regain some health. And I've just recently started to get that boundary back. I can see how I can manage my health and continue with BCSM and continue my advocacy. Because one of the things that's always been essential to me is to get curated information out to people with cancer. And because we see so much s spreading around that uh, it, it is really, truly unfortunate. So, um, you know, I feel comfortable starting to blog again. And now I know when I get in another transition with, with treatment, I'll probably handle it the same way. But there, these are critical decisions. And I, I thought I'd best just slow down and get a grip on how I'm feeling physically and emotionally before I just keep writing away. And right. I'll save that for later. All right, so last question. This is from Twitter. Thanks again to everybody on Twitter. Hi, Twitter. Hi, Twitter. Um, for all these Hello, questions. Twitter. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read this verbatim because I, OK. Uh, what is your superpower as a patient? Uh, what can you do that your doctors cannot? Jody, we'll start with you. Oh, wow. What can I do that my doctors cannot? Well, um, I really admire and respect my oncologist and his perception of how it will manage my disease. 
I, what he cannot provide, which my community provides, which my family provides, which my everyone I, I know provides is love. And that's the healer. Hmm. Emily? Oh, you guys got me with this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think my, my first thought was connectivity, being able to connect patients, mm. patients, and patients to med students and patients to PA students and patients to pharmacists. Um, I've been able to do that through email and blogs. But on that same token, I think physicians can do that. You know, I don't think that's a superpower, so to speak, no, that's, that's unique true. to us. Yeah. I think it's possible, and I know social media for um, healthcare clinicians is difficult. It's water that has to be treaded carefully. Mm. Um, but I do believe that we can start, I mean, I think we've already started it, we're here starting to have that, that interconnectivity between clinicians and patients. So I don't, I I don't think that's unique to us. No. I think that's something that it's out there. anyone can, can jump into if they do it the right way. Aaron? Yeah, I, I kind of agree with what Emily said. It's not, it's not unique to patients to do that. I think um, in my situation, being a caregiver, I, I sit in a unique seat where I have had the opportunity to learn and to educate myself on the stuff that the doctors have access to and that they know um, and find my own information, but I also live the day-to-day -day and I see what it's like um, in my dealings with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation too. I know that there's, there's a disconnect and the way that that disconnect can be bridged is through the patients who have this experience with both, with all sides. So um, I think that's, that's unique to patients. Uh, I think passion is probably the, the unique mm -hmm. point, is that, you know, yes, the, the physician has learned all he can about it, but he doesn't live it. And, and there's some uh, there's some occasions where they do, but they don't live this illness, they don't live this injury, and having the passion to step forward because, you know, you can make that decision when you have something like this. You can sit down and, you know, like I always, my big thing is, you can take this and let it be part of who you are, or you can take this and let it be who you are. Mm -hmm. And those are your decisions. Yeah. For me, part of who I am is I'm an amputee. I'm also a paramedic, a father, a friend, a brother, a son. You know, I have all these labels. I'm not Joe who's an amputee and that's all I can be. You know, I, I take on all these other labels and this is just a part. I'm integrating it into my life. <laughs> uh, so I guess I'd like to answer this too as far as I'm concerned. My doctor could not moderate a panel of fantastic e-patients. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. I, I don't think he could actually handle that conversation. Um, so I'd like to thank all of you um, for being up here and, and sharing your stories, you know, then, now, hopefully in the future. For everybody else out there in the, in the audience, you know, all these e-patients, we're up in the front. We'd love to talk with you. Okay. Go ahead and ask. Um, and I guess I'd like to give a shout-out to Twitter again. Apparently right now we are the number one trending topic on Twitter. So Woo. nice work. Nice. Exciting. Um, That's great. That's great. So I, I, I guess that's supposed to be it for the new patient. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, we have a question, yes. What is lifestyle adequate care? Mm -hmm. So like Emily, in your case, when your pain management doctor uh, sits down with you and devises a monthly plan of how many pills per month, and then you go to the pharmacy to fill it, and your health insurer says, no, 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 you can't have 210 pills a month, you can only have 150, or Joe, in your case, because you've confided in me, you have a prosthetic leg, but now you have a nine month old baby and now you want a new one that's waterproof so you could be a dad and play with your children. Your doctor will say, well, this is the one you need, but you'll go to your health insurer and they'll say no. What, how do you deal with that, number one? And number two, what are the uh, healthcare social media methods that you have in mind to deal with that? Um, I know personally, I've been very fortunate um, to have insurance that has not given me too much trouble, but when I've had it, I have gone straight to Twitter. Um, and I think there's a way to reach out on Twitter to those pharmaceutical companies without, you know, with that anger, but to say it with grace and to be professional. Um, and when they don't respond, I've just retweeted <laughs> and retweeted. <laughs> I've sent email, you know, I've done hours of Googling to find CEO emails and, you know, the head of this department or that department. 
I've filed formal complaints through their, you know, their whole processing. I've filed appeals. Um, so I'll do whatever it takes. Um, and I think it's hard for a lot of us, and I'm sure for patients that are in the hospital or, or very weak, very sick, to have to do that. It takes hours and time and brain power that many of us don't necessarily have when we're really sick and trying to get that medication. Um, but, it, you know, that it's persistence. It's persistence. Yeah. And it's professionalism. Yeah, it's it professionalism. Is. I think it's, it's also, instead of just complaining to them about it, it's offering them mm -hmm. the opportunity yeah. to participate in creating a solution. So I have an idea, let me help you. Let me offer you my time and my expertise and tell you these are the obstacles that I'm having to this working for both of us. So let's, let's talk together, let's work together. Here's the opportunity to change. Are you willing to embrace that? And that's where the communities hit, help with the gap. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk with your other patients across communities, not just in yeah. the cancer community, yeah. but the different strategies that worked to get you to where you needed to go. Exactly. So I'm, they're playing the music in my ear. We're going to wrap it up right now. Thanks, everybody, for uh, <laughs> Thank being you. up here and sharing Thank the story. You. Thank Thanks, you everybody out there. Thanks.